Hello, welcome to session 205 Delightful UI. My name's Richard Turton. I'm going to start off by discussing what Delightful UI is and what I mean by it. It is UI that allows you to get your work done in an app, but if you're in the mood, you can just play with it as well, and it makes you smile. Playable UI is UI in your app that is interactive, and not just interactive, but interactive in a sort of swooshy, backwards and forwards, fun kind of a way. I love making apps with UI like this, so much so that I was given this plaque at work. It says, Head of Fabulization. Today, I'm going to teach you how to add some personal touches to two common components of your apps to sprinkle some delightful fairy dust over them. First, some guidelines. To make delightful UI, you need good taste, which unfortunately, I can't teach you today. You need artistic talent, which unfortunately, I can't teach you today. Assuming you've got those two in place, you need to think about respecting the user. By this I mean, don't get in their way, don't take time away from what the user wants to do, don't make the user figure out non-standard interactions. Make your app fun if the user is in the mood for fun and if it's appropriate for the app. So for example, if you've got a stocks and shares app and your user has just lost half of their fortune, don't tell them that with a fun animation, they won't thank you for it. Um, when I talk about playability in the UI, I mean, as I mentioned before, the user can fiddle about with it just for its own sake. If you can get them sat there and just while they're idle, playing with your UI just because it's nice to do, then you've cracked it. Um, when I discuss sound effects, I don't mean in-app sound effects because they're usually quite annoying. What I mean is that when you're thinking about the UI or using the UI, it's almost impossible not to make silly sound effects with your own voice. So you pull in something, you're going whoosh, whoop, 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 backwards and forwards, that sort of thing. Again, if you can find yourself making that, you've cracked it. So overall, the best thing to do is to make fun variations on the standard UI. That's the way of meeting all of these goals. It's an opportunity to give your app a little bit of personality without making it impossible to use. Some examples from apps that I like are here. You can see the pull to refresh animation from Twitterific. So if you look carefully at the thing, you can see this is a two stage animation. When you, the user pulls down, you can see the egg spinning around and starting to crack. And then when they let go, you can see Tweety fly along. And that two stage animation is what you're going to learn about in the first part of the demo. And incidentally, if you have a copy of Twitterific, which is a very good Twitter client, if you pull that pull to refresh control all the way down to the bottom of the screen, which you need to do with two thumbs, then you can play Flappy Bird. You can thank me for that later. Another good example is in the Activity app. When you, If you manage to make any of the achievements in the Activity app, when you select one there, you can see it spins out towards the screen. That's actually a navigation transition, but it doesn't look anything like the standard navigation transition. And in the second demo, you're going to learn how to make a custom navigation transition. So let's talk about the pull to refresh control, which is the first thing you're going to make. Unfortunately, UI refresh control, which is the standard pull to refresh control that comes as part of iOS, is not designed for subclassing. There's nothing in there that allows you to customize the appearance or the timing or the size or anything like that. So you need to build it yourself um, as a UI control subclass. UI Refresh Control does a lot of things behind the scenes that you need to replicate in your own subclass. For example, it needs to know about the scroll view that it's attached to. It needs to pick up scrolling events. It needs to actually control the scroll view. When, you, when it's in its refreshing phase, you normally adjust the content inset so that you can see the refreshing animation at the top of your content. It also needs to know about scroll events. So um, when the user's dragging, when the user releases, that sort of thing. Now UI Refresh Control does all that stuff in the background and it probably does it in a slightly naughty way that you can't as a third party developer reproduce, but you're going to learn how to do all of these things in the demo. And if you remember back from the Twitterific example, it's a two phase process. So the first phase is as the user is pulling down on the content. So at this point, your control has to listen to the scrolling events. It updates its display based on the offset. So it's an animation, but it's not an animation that runs over a certain amount of time. It's an animation that moves on frame by frame as the user is scrolling. 
as they scroll, it listens to see if it has gone past a particular threshold, at which point, if the user then releases, <laughs> it will trigger the refresh action. If the user releases before you get to the threshold, the content just bounces back up again. This is the way the standard UI refresh control works. So if they've pulled down and they've gone past the threshold and they've let go, you start the refreshing process. At this point, you send a control event that tells whatever is listening that the user has asked for a refresh. You adjust the scroll view inset so that the refresh animation can happen at the top of the screen. And you start a looping animation because the refresh event could take any amount of time. You don't know how long that takes. So you need a looping animation for the user to look at while they're waiting for your content to arrive. And then at that point, your refresh control just sits there looping, waiting until the content has arrived and then it gets told to stop and at that point it bounces back up and disappears. So let's move on to the demo. Okay in this first demo you're going to learn how to create a custom refresh control and then wire it up to your table view. First of all if you open the uh, project in demo one starter let's build and run and get a look at the app. It's a dating app for zombies. So there is a list of cold zombies in your area that are all looking for love or possibly brains. Zombies don't move very fast, so this view doesn't update automatically. So we have a pull to refresh control for fetching new zombies. But it's so boring. You're going to make a new one with a more romantic theme. So let's switch back to Xcode. Open up the controls group. and use command N to create a new file. Choose iOS, source, Cocoa Touch class, and click next. Name the class zombie refresh control, and make it a subclass of UI control. Put the file where Xcode tells you to put it. Let's just give ourselves a bit of room on the screen here. Okay, we can delete the template comments and we're going to add some properties to the class. First of all, a weak variable which is going to hold a reference to the scroll view. I'm going to make that an implicitly unwrapped optional. And then some internal state to manage the um, pulling and refreshing status. So has reached threshold will be updated while the user is pulling. That's going to be a bool with a default value of false. another ball which is going to hold whether or not the control is already refreshing and then an image view which is going to hold the a picture of a heart which we're going to use for a romantic refresh control So the first thing we're going to do is a little bit of setup and we're going to override the function did move to super view. Call the super because we're good iOS citizens and what we're doing this for is because it only makes sense to add this refresh control to a scroll view. So at this point we're going to check that we're being added to a scroll view. We're going to set our scroll view reference and if we're not being added to a scroll view we're going to crash the app because it's a developer failure to do this. So we can do that with a guard statement.
So that assertion failure is going to hit if they accidentally add it to something that isn't a scroll view. If it is a scroll view, we can set our reference. make the size of the, scroll, of the refresh control the right size, which is going to be the size of the image view. And we can you can position the refresh control off the top of the content. So here we make a point which is in X, Y, it's in the middle of the scroll view. and why it is half the height of the refresh control off the top of the screen, which means it will be just off the top of the screen. And we need to add the image view so that it's actually visible. So if we switch now to zombie list view controller, Swift. Just save the file there. We're going to add a new property to the class. And in view to load, there's a line here where we make a standard refresh control. Instead, we're going to make our zombie refresh control. I'm going to add it to the table view. Finally, this property here is warning because the refresh control of a table view controller is a UI refresh control and we're trying to assign a zombie refresh control to it. So we just need to change that so that it's our property. So if you build and run right now, <coughs> you'll see the heart image which we've made. It doesn't do anything at the moment because it's not working as a refresh control, but it's nice to know that it's there, we've added it, and it's in the right place. So switching back to Xcode, we're interested in when the user moves the scroll view and when they let go. A UI refresh control does this all in the background, but we can't do that. So we're going to have to implement two methods that are themselves called from the scroll view delegate methods. This is where using your custom refresh control is slightly less convenient than using the build hill one. First of all, we're going to handle scrolling actions. So add the following method to zombie refresh control dot swift. It's going to be called containing scroll view did scroll and it's going to take a UI scroll view parameter. First of all, we want to check if we're refreshing or not. If this control is already refreshing, just do nothing. If we're not already refreshing, then we need to calculate how far the user has scrolled. So the offset is going to be the 
the negative of the scroll views content offset y plus the scroll views content inset top. So as you scroll, you're adjusting the content offset and the content inset is the amount that is already there. So we switch back briefly to Keynote. There's a little visual of this. So here's your screen. The navigation bar is at the top. The content is underneath. How this is built up is the green area is your scroll view, which is inside the window and filling it. The navigation bar is on top of the scroll view. The content does not fill the entire scroll view. And that red area highlighted at the top there is the top inset. And the, the current position of the scroll view is called the content offset. So as the user scrolls down, the offset gets larger, but the inset remains the same. The maximum offset is how far the user is going to be able to scroll until we decide that we've both finished changing the animation and that they've reached the threshold after which if they let go, the refresh event will be triggered. And our pulling animation is going to be a simple scale. So we need to calculate how far to scale the size of the heart related to how far the user has scrolled. So the maximum scale is going to be 1, otherwise it's going to be the offset divided by the maximum offset. So we're going to use that scale to make a transform for the heart image view. Make sure the heart is visible. And we're going to set our threshold value to true if the amount the user has scrolled is above our maximum offset value. Okay, so we switch back to zombie list view controller.swift. I'm going to add the scroll view delegate method. We do that in an extension. So it's nice to group delegate methods together in extensions. And the one we want to override is scroll view did scroll. And all we're doing here is pass that method on. To the zombie refresh control. Oh, we need to override. If we build and run again, now you can see that the heart grows as we scroll down and then it stops growing when we reach the maximum offset. So that's part one of the refresh control. The next part is to add the looping animation. So again, we need to re-implement UI refresh controls methods to start and end refreshing. So if you switch back to zombie refresh control .swift, the two methods are begin refreshing and end refreshing. So we'll start with begin refreshing. This is going to be called when the user lets go of the, of the scroll view after they've scrolled past the threshold. Again, if you're already refreshing, we don't want to do anything here. We 
you set the refreshing value to true because you can only start refreshing once. And what we need to do here is because we're going to affect the content inset so that we can see the refresh control at the top, uh, we need to store the current offset because we're going to do this inside an animation to prevent a little visual jerk. So we just need to store that offset and then do a zero duration animation. Just the simplest one, animated duration animations. Content inset from the scroll view, and we're going to increase the top. By the size of the heart, this would mean there'll be enough room at the top of the scroll view to show the heart. And because changing the inset changes the offset, we need to reset the offset to the stored value. to prevent it um, jerking for us. So that takes care of moving the scroll view. The second thing we need to do is start the looping animation. For this one, we want the full options Um, animation methods, so that's animate with duration, delay, options, animations, which is the third one down in the autocomplete. The duration is going to be half a second, and the delay is going to be zero. The options are going to be auto reverse and repeat because we want the animation to repeat. The animation itself is going to be quite simple. We just set another scale transform. So that's going to scale it down to three quarters of its size, and then it's going to auto reverse and repeat, which means it scales back up to full size, and then back to three quarters of a size, and so on, until we tell it to stop. And there's no completion block. End refreshing is a bit simpler. Again, we only want to do this if we are actually refreshing. And what you do here is re re um, reverse the things you did to the scroll view in the first place. And this is the animate with durations and end completion method. animations are going to be to reset the content inset. And when we're doing it this way we don't need to worry about the visual jerk because we want the scroll view to move back up to where it was. And the completion block to reset the properties. We 
remove all animations, we'll get rid of that looping animation that we added in begin refreshing. Okay, now we just have to connect that refreshing to when the user lets go. So this is going to be another sort of scroll view delegate method that we call from the real delegate method. So I'll add that in here. It'll be called containing scroll view did end dragging. It takes a parameter of the scroll view and a bool will decelerate. This is the equivalent of the scroll view delegate method. So if we've reached that scrolling threshold, we need to send our control events. Send actions for control events. And the URI refresh control sends value changed when you've scrolled it far enough and let go. So we'll do the same thing. And then we can begin refreshing. So you switch back to zombie list view controller.swift and in the scroll view delegate extension we're looking for scroll view did end dragging will decelerate and again all we do is pass that on if you don't save the other file, then it doesn't appear in autocomplete. Containing scroll view did end dragging. Then we pass in the scroll view and the will decelerate property. And the last thing we do is update the refresh method in this view controller which is what is called when the refresh control is fired. So here, instead of self refresh control and refreshing, we change that to zombie refresh control and refreshing. So if we build and run now, pull to refresh, here's part one as the heart grows. We've gone past the threshold, we let go, the heart beats, it disappears. And that is how you make a custom refresh control. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next stage. And before we move on, here's an example of a refresh control that I made for an app. Um, it's quite hard to see from this video because we only had a, um, a small capture of it. But there's a, a train and a platform, and as you pull down, the train pulls into the platform, passengers get on the train, and then the looping part of the animation is the train goes swooshing past the screen. So if we just have a quick look at this, you can see the people on the platform, they get on the train and then it loops on. I didn't make this video, I got someone to make it for me because I'd left the office by that point. So apologies for that. So moving on to navigation transitions. Okay, a custom navigation transition is performed by an object that conforms to UI view controller animated transitioning protocol. These objects, we tend to call them animation controllers. They're supplied by the navigation controller delegate, which is asked for a animation controller for every single push or pop transition that the navigation controller tries to do. The animation controller has two jobs. It has to display the new view and it has to perform any animations that you want it to do. So the way it works is the navigation controller asks its delegate if it has an animation controller for this for every specific combination of from view controller to view controller and operation, operation being push or pop. If there's a custom transition that's been built the delegate returns the animation controller, which conforms to UI view controller animated transitioning. And that object displays the new view and performs the animations. Now, there are 
lots of ways to do custom transition animations in view controllers and there are a lot of mistakes that you can make. I know this because I've made a lot of them myself. And these are the best practices that I've arrived at after many, many attempts at making transitions that don't ruin the rest of your app. It's absolutely vital that you keep low impact on your view controllers. You don't want really any transition specific code in your view controller if you can avoid it. You don't want to tie your transition to specific view controller subclasses. It makes much more sense for the view controllers to conform to a protocol that says, yes, I can take part in this transition. That gives you a lot more flexibility as you go on to develop other parts of the app. It also makes a lot of sense to do all of your animations on a disposable canvas view. I call it a canvas because I'm an artist. Um, this way that when you've finished, you can just get rid of the canvas view and all of the changes you've made, all the animations just disappear. There's no real cleanup associated. Tied in very closely with that is that you never animate the views that are owned by your view controller. How do you make that work then? You do snapshots. You do lots and lots and lots and lots of snapshots. Um, you'll see this as we get onto it, but if you don't use snapshots and you've animated something, um, then when you come back, you usually have to reverse it back to the position it was at the start of the animation, otherwise things go all wrong. You're messing up auto layout. It just doesn't work. Speaking of auto layout, don't attempt to do any transition animations using auto layout and constraints. If you use snapshots in a canvas, um, there are convenience methods that I've written, which you will see, that will take advantage of the auto layout you've built into your view controller, but put disposable snapshot views on your canvas at the right position. You can then use the more obvious frame and center animations to move them around. And then when they're finished, we can get rid of them. So let's have a look at the effect we're aiming for. This is slowed down quite a lot. So you see you click on someone's name and the name label and the image view go to the top of the detail screen. The other table view cells fade out of place and then the new table view cells zoom in. So it's quite a nice looking effect and hopefully you'll see that it can be achieved without too much effort as we move into demo number two. Okay, in this demo, you're going to learn the principles of custom transitions and how to create them without messing up your view controllers. You can open the project in demo two starter, or you can continue with the project that you built in the first demo. Either one is fine. First of all, let's build and run the app. And select one of our zombies that's looking for love. Let's go for Elliot. There's a transition. It's just a standard navigation transition. It's not very delightful. Let's have a look at Elliot. He likes brains, nine remaining fingers, and only 11% decomposition. Sounds like a keeper. So let's move back to Xcode. First of all, we're going to create an animation controller. They're done by objects. Custom transitions are done by objects that conform to UI view controller animated transitioning. So select the animation controllers group and hit Command N to make a new file. Choose iOS source, Cocoa Touch class, and call the class list to detail animator and make it a subclass of NS object. Create the file, put it where Xcode tells you to. We're going to declare that the class implements the UI view controller animator transitioning protocol by entering it here. And we'll immediately get some warnings because we haven't implemented the protocol method yet. So let's add some code to this class. First of all, we have a duration, which is going to control how long the whole transition takes. And we're going to set this to 0.4, which is going to be 0.4 seconds. And one of the required functions from the protocol is transition duration, which takes an argument of the transition context. But we don't particularly care about the context of this method, so we're just going to return our duration constant. The second method we have to implement 
is called animate transition. And that also takes the transition context. And for now, we're just going to leave that blank. This is going to be a stub. The detail we're going to put in is a little bit of boilerplate. You have to do this in almost every custom transition that you make. The transition context object, which conforms to UI view controller context transitioning, there are a lot of lengthy protocols involved in custom animations, um, contains details about the view controllers that are leaving the screen, arriving on the screen, the views of those view controllers, and the overall container view, which is where the animation is happening. And quite often you need to pull out all of those um, all of those values into variables so that you can use them in your animation. So first we will get the from view controller. And there isn't a nice property for any of these. We have to use view controller for key. And then the key is incredibly long. UI transition context from view controller key. Give myself a bit more room here. And we also want the two controller. View controller for key. transition context to view controller key and we make these they're optionals and we know they're going to be there so we can make them implicitly unwrapped optionals you can also get the views directly out using the view for key method And we only really want the two view at this point. And the last thing we take out of the context is the container view. Which is also an optional, but we know it's going to be there so we can unwrap it. I forgot to unwrap the two view as well. So remember, the animation controller has two jobs. It has to add in the view, and it has to perform any animations. So to add in the view, what we do is add in the view. It's very simple. Container adds a view to view. And you can set the frame of the incoming view for something else that comes from the context, which is final frame for view controller. we pass that the two view controller and then now we've given it a frame we tell it to lay out because when we come to do the animations we need the view to be laid out correctly so that the animations work we're going to add a really basic crossfade transition so first of all the two view is going to have an alpha of zero and then we're going to animate it in we're going to animate with duration and completion handler. And the duration is going to be the duration property that we supplied earlier on. The animation is quite simple. The two view is going to have an alpha of 1. And the completion, this is very important. You have to tell the context that the completion has finished. This allows it to get the view controller hierarchy correct and um, make sure that everything is in order, otherwise weird things happen later on. And there's a cancelled flag 
and which is also held inside the, the context. So this is also slightly confusing. We want the opposite of the transition context. Transition was cancelled function. So again, all of this stuff here is sort of boilerplate that you'll need to do for every single custom transition. And this is actually a complete animation controller. If we connect this up, we can see it in action. So let's do that. We need a, de a delegate for the navigation controller. So in app delegate.swift, which currently has absolutely nothing inside it, we're going to implement application did finish launching with options. And at this point, we will take out the navigation controller. Windows root view controller. function you have to return true. So we we try and grab the root view controller of the window. If it is a navigation controller, we set ourselves as its delegate. But the application delegate at the moment isn't a navigation controller's delegate. So we need to make sure it conforms to that. So in an extension, give myself a bit of room. We want animation controller for operation which is a very long method. So I would suggest you use the autocomplete like I did. And all we're going to do is return one of our list of detail animator objects. So if you build and run now, and do a navigation push, you'll see that it crossfades. It's quite useful when you're first setting up these custom transitions just to make sure that they're wired in correctly and everything is going to work as you expect it to before you spend hours on your animation code and then wonder why it's not working. It's always good to know that you've actually wired it up properly. So we're going to make the selected cells image and the label glide across their new positions and fade in and fade out the other views, which will be much more delightful. So switch back to Xcode and switch back to list to detail animator.swift. Now, we're not going to tie this transition to any specific view controller subclasses. We're going to declare a protocol instead so that you can make almost any view controller take part in this transition if you want. So the protocol is going to be called list to detail animatable. And to conform to this protocol, you have to do two things. You have to supply an array of morph views these are the views that are going to change size and position but are the same between one view controller and the next and you need to supply an array of animatable cells and these are going to be table view cells which are the ones that will fade out if you're the outgoing view controller or fade in if you're the incoming view controller. So it's a simple protocol and let's make sure that our view controllers can actually conform to it. So if you open 
zombie list view controller dot swift we're going to make it conform to the protocol now zombie list view controller is always going to be the is often going to be the from view controller and because we've selected one of the cells and the selected cell contains the image view and label that we want to keep we need to know which cell we've selected so that we don't supply that cell as part of the list of cells that get faded out so we need to keep track of which cell has been selected so we can add that as a property we'll call it a selected cell make it an optional because there won't always be a selected cell so prepare for segue is where the um, transition will start from so at that point we can just say selected cell equals cell we'll conform to the protocol in a class extension So to provide the morph views, all we need to do is give back the zombie image view. We know that the selected cell will always be present at this point because the view controller will never be asked for its um, morph views until you've selected a cell because the transition won't be happening. The animatable cells will be all the visible cells filtered by them not being the selected cell. So this is all the cells that you can see on the screen except the one that has been selected. And we do the same in zombie detail view controller dot swift. Again in an extension. This has the image view as a top level property because it doesn't have a table, it's a head of view. And the animatable cells. Are all of the cells in the table. So it's a bit simpler for the detail view controller. Okay, now we've made our view controllers able to take part in the transition, we need going to actually add some fancy things to the transition. So switch back to list of detail animator. So delete the lines from animate transition that do the simple fade animation and replace them with the following. We're going to make the canvas view that I talked about earlier. It's going to be the same size as the container. Excuse me, I forgot to type in equals. So the background color to the destination view's background color.
and this is now on top of the two view. So if you ran this at the moment, the canvas would cover everything. You wouldn't see anything on there. The canvas is where all the animations are going to take place. Okay. And the secret source to easy transitions is to use snapshots. Lots and lots and lots of snapshots. So let's make them now. First of all, we're going to cast to um, list to detail animatable objects so that we can access those properties that we define in the protocol. Get the snapshots. I made a convenience method here called snapshot views. I'm going to take the animatable cells from the free or from view controller and we're going to do the snapshot before screen updates. Do the same for the two view controller. In this case, we want after updates to be true because remember we've only just added the two view controller to the screen and laid it out. So all that needs to happen before we can take the snapshots. Let's have a quick look at the implementation of this snapshot views method so you can understand what is going on. So there are two ones. You've got a snapshot view and a snapshot views, and they both do pretty similar things that just Cause of course snapshot view for each one in the array. So it takes a normal snapshot using the UI view method, it adds it into the view that was that is called the method on, and then it moves it to the correct place in the screen. So normally when you just take a snapshot, it has the correct size, but its position is zero zero. This convenience method puts it in the right place, adds it to the correct view. So it just saves you a few steps and keeps your transition code looking quite clean. And we're going to use a scale transform to grow the cells in or shrink the cells out. That's going to be from 50% of the size. each of the incoming snapshots because they're going to start small. We apply that transform now. And we set the alpha to zero. That gets us all ready to go. And now we need to do the actual animation. And we're going to do this using UI view keyframe animations. And keyframe animations are a great way to do several related animations, um, one after the other, or in a specific sequence without having to chain via completion blocks. Another nice thing about keyframe animations is that you can set an overarching duration for the whole animation, and the individual keyframes will adjust their speed and duration to fit in with that. So if we decide to slow down this transition, which we'll do later on to look at the detail, it gives us a lot more information about what's happening. So the duration we're going to pass in is going to be the overarching duration that we've specified for the transition. The delay is going to be zero. For the options, we want a calculation mode of linear which just makes the animation flow along smoothly in the way that you want. And the animations are cells we're going to fill in in just a second, but just before we move on to that, the completion block needs to be done. And if you remember, that has to have the cleanup and the transition complex. So the cleanup code is quite simple. 
we just get rid of the canvas. And then we finish the transition. Using the transition was cancelled negative value. Okay, we can fill in the animations now. <clears throat> it's going to be two keyframes. So with that, you do add keyframe with relative start time. So we want this to start right at the beginning of the animation. And the relative duration, we want it to take a quarter of the whole transition time. And the animations that we're going to add we're going to scale out the outgoing snapshots. And we're going to fade them out. Okay, and then we're going to do the opposite to the incoming snapshots. At this point, we want this to be three quarters of the way through the transition. We're going to take the remaining quarter of the time. incoming snapshots, we're going to set the transform back to identity, and the alpha to 1. And I mentioned about the good thing about keyframes is that the whole animation can be adjusted to take this one thing. So let's have a change the property at the very top to make the whole transition take 4 seconds and then build and run. Perform the transition and you can see they fade out and the new ones fade in. Nothing else happens yet because we haven't built the rest of the transition but it is nice to see. And it'll do the same backwards. It fades out and the new ones fade in. So now we need to move on to the morph view since we've dealt with the animatable cells. The morphing transition is a little bit like the magic move on Keynote. It's for elements that exist in both view controllers but are different sizes or positions. So we go back to list the detail animator.swift and we're going to add a new method to it. animate morph from view to view so what this is going to do is move an individual view so first of all we start by making a snapshot using the same method we used before, but instead of the array one, we're going to do the single view. And after updates is false for the from view. And true, oops, and true Or the two view for the same reasons as before because the two view has only just been added to the screen. So the target center is the current position of the two view, so that's where the view is going to end up at the end of the transition. We're going to make the two view invisible. 
and we're going to make the two view the same size as the from view. And this is done with a convenience method called scale transform to view. So all this does is compares the sizes of the two views and returns an affine transform that will make one view the same size as the other one. And look at the implementation, that's here. So it's the bounds of one over the bounds of the other. And we're going to move it to the same position as the from view. So at the moment, the two view will be scaled to the same size as the from view in the same place as the from view, but it'll be invisible. And what's going to happen in the animation is that both of those views are going to be moved to the new position. And during the move, the from view will be faded out and the to view will be faded in. So if there are any artifacts in scaling, this will minimize the appearance of them because as one changes size about halfway across, you'll start to see the other one. So you'll never get one that's been fully scaled to the other size and might look a bit jaggedy or something like that. So the animation is just the plain animation with duration. There's no completion block needed. Again, it's going to take the overarching duration constant. And we take the from view, it's going to fade out. And it is going to grow or shrink to the size of the two view. And you can do this by inverting. the transform that we currently have. And the I do the opposite to the two view, so the two view is going to fade in. The transform we're going to go back to identity. center will be target center. So as they move and fade between, it will be a nice smooth transition. Um, we'll just add a convenience method to call this same method but for an array of views since we know that our morph views are going to come in as an array. We're actually going to pass in an array of tuples where the first element in the tuple is the from view and the second element in the tuple is the to view. That's how you extract elements from the tuple. Okay, so if you move back to the end of animate transition, what we're going to do is call that convenience method animate morph views, and you can also get quite clever and zip the two arrays together so this will make that array of tuples that we send to the convenience method Okay, so we build and run again, and remember we've set the duration to 4 seconds so we can really appreciate the best of this transition. You can see the morph happening, and then the fade, and isn't that great?
So, at this time you should have a good understanding of how to make a custom transition without too much impact on your view controllers. If you remember, we only added a very small amount of code to each view controller. So now you're ready to move on to the lab where you're going to make this transition interactive. Here's an example of a custom navigation transition that I made for a client. Um, you can see it's a bit over the top. Um, there's a little bounce, there's a circular cutout that moves along, there's images that move all over the place. We had a lot of fun making this app. It was really simple functionality wise, so we probably spent about 60 or 70% of the development time on custom transitions, and it was one of the most fun I've ever had in a project. Hope you enjoy looking at it. Okay, hopefully you've finished with the lab by now, and uh, it's time to wrap up. So what have you learned today? You've learned about how to make a custom refresh control, how you need to subclass UI control to achieve it, what the two parts of the refresh action are, and the principles of the animations you need in there. You then learn how to make custom transitions without scattering transition logic all over your view controllers and spoiling them. You've learned about the power of snapshots and keyframe animations. In the lab, you made that transition interactive using a gesture recognizer, which added to the playable part of the delightful UI that I was talking about in the introduction. Other things to look at from here, I would suggest um, now you've learned these new skills, you go and look at your favorite apps and see if there's any parts of UI in there that you particularly enjoy. Look for the things I talked about, things where you can just play with it for the sake of it. Think about how you might implement that in your own apps, how you might take these skills and make your own apps delightful. If you like particular parts of UI, have a little play around and see if you can make it. If you can't find any apps or any inspiration, I suggest you can look at the website Captivate.co, which has hundreds of examples of really nice bits of UI, um, and it's always nice to have a play around with that. If you want to talk to me about any of this stuff, I'm Rich Turton on Twitter. Um, Thank you for listening. Goodbye.